Good evening. Uh, I'm Pepper Culpepper. Uh, I teach here at the Blavatnik School of Government, um, and it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce Dan Honig, um, who's going to talk about his book, Navigation by Judgment, Why and When Top-Down Control of Foreign Aid Doesn't Work. Um, and it's especially a pleasure for me because, because I taught Dan when he was a student at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and uh, to see a, a scholar progress along the stages, I'm looking forward to seeing whether the dissertation worked out or not in its book form. Um, and, and I'll find out, as you will, during the talk. So there's a little suspense, uh, a little drama. Um, but Dan is uh, a very impressive scholar. But not only that, um, he's, he's done a lot of things in the real world. He's uh, been an advisor to the Minister of Finance uh, in Liberia. He's run a nonprofit aimed at young people in East Timor. Uh, and he's worked for a number of local and international uh, NGOs. So um, he walks the walk and he talks the talk. And he's going to talk to us tonight about uh, agencies that don't walk the walk well or how they screw it up when they direct from the top. But to let me not anticipate his message anymore um, or take any more of his time. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dan Honig. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for taking the time. You know, Friday at 5.30, I imagine there are other things you might have imagined yourself doing uh, a few weeks ago at this time. And I appreciate you uh, choosing to be here um, and hear a little bit about this book. So, uh, you know, and Pepper, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me say, you know, I'll leave it to you to navigate by judgment at the end as to whether, uh, whether indeed uh, where this has come from uh, where it started in your, in your class. Uh, Oh, I don't know, a decade ago, something like that. So uh, in terms of the talk, let me start here, which is the view out my window in Monrovia, Liberia, about a decade ago. So at the time, I was the uh, aid management advisor to the Liberian uh, Minister of Finance. Um, and I took this picture for no uh, sort of work-related purpose. I, I took this picture because uh, the windows had just been replaced, um, and thus they were clean. Uh, and on what I suspected was the only day I would ever have a clean view out my window, I thought I would take a picture of the scene I had looked at uh, for the past few years. Uh, but as I look at uh, this picture today, what strikes me is that there are many things we can imagine foreign aid projects focusing on in this image, right? We can imagine the foreign aid project that would uh, help rebuild the building on the top right. That's a government building that had been destroyed during Liberia's uh, civil war, right? We can imagine the project that would help re rebuild the bridge at the top of the photo. This bridge had fallen down during the conflict, right? And we can imagine, you know, sort of driving construction of the bridge using clearly defined measures, a clear kind of blueprint approach that went from one stage to another and let us know if we were making project progress, right? And we can imagine how measurement and metrics would be a really helpful part of building the bridge well, rebuilding the building, right? Same is true uh, for the traffic light in the foreground. There are no traffic, working traffic lights at this time in Liberia. Um, and uh, for the building uh, just behind the traffic light, which is actually the Ministry of Transportation responsible for the traffic light just in front of it. Um, and we could, the lights are off in the ministry, uh, even though it's midday on a cloudy day, in part because uh, there's no central power grid, right? Uh, so all power comes from generators, and uh, that power is expensive, and often you leave the lights off. And so, you know, we can imagine for each of these projects a kind of clear uh, blueprint led by measures that would drive us towards success. Uh, but, of course, we all know that there are a ton of things in this scene around which it's a lot harder to put a circle on which foreign aid projects work and which indeed need to improve for sort of the lives of the people on the street in this street scene uh, to realize the kind of growth and opportunity, uh, which I would argue is kind of the remit uh, of development assistance of foreign aid. You know, we can turn on the lights uh, of the ministry using a blueprint, but what about the energy and ability and capacities of the people within? Uh, and that's kind of the central problematic that I started with. How do we think differently about these different kinds of tasks and also these different kinds of environments, the view out the sort of window in Liberia as opposed to the equivalent picture in Botswana and how we might think of, uh, of how we might want to manage our aid interventions. So, you know, I don't think this is an easy choice. Uh, I don't know, is there one in the audience who speaks Turkish? Can I ask? Okay. So, Good. In that case, I get to mistranslate this. Anyway, no, this is the translation. So the gentleman on the right, who I should say, I was asked at a prior talk 
Uh, I'm not related to this, uh, to this individual in the photo. There's no, no relation between me and him. So uh, the words over his head here translate from Turkish to uh, spit up, you hit the mustache. Spit down, you hit the beard, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I use that as a way of saying, and you know, it is in Turkish an expression that one uses when indeed there are no sort of clear and obvious ways to move forward, right? And I think that you know, if we think about kind of a stylized continuum of management strategies, uh, foreign aid organizations find themselves in a spit up, you hit the mustache, spit up, you hit the beard, or spit, yes, you know what I'm saying, spit up, you hit the mustache, spit down, you hit the beard kind of world, right? There are flaws both to sort of letting agents drive uh, and to tight top-down control. So, you know, if I control from the top, I'm going to get sort of, of course, more control. I'm going to get more oversight. If I use rules, I'm going to get standardized behavior by different people in dissimilar places, right? I'm going to be able to get more similar outputs, more similar behavior from my staff. Um, I might be able to get more extrinsic motivation uh, because I'm going to be able to set a target and drive people towards meeting that target. Uh, but I'm also going to get these distortions of performance measurement. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, we know from uh, contract theory, uh, from economics, that if we have a task that has multiple parts, a multitask problem, where some of the tasks are measurable and some, of the ta some parts of the task are measurable and some parts of the task aren't, if we measure the measurable parts, we're going to get more of those parts, but we're going to get less of everything else, right? People are going to overinvest in the part of the job that's measured and underinvest in the rest of it. In addition, we know that if we don't give people on the ground the ability to use their authority, the ability to use their judgment to collect information, right, uh, they won't collect it. So that is to say, to use the information they collect, then they won't collect it. So that is to say, even if you want to do the right thing, uh, if you have no way to make use of, of local knowledge about the environment, uh, you will do something else rather than go collect that knowledge. And that doesn't just hurt the project, it also hurts what the organization knows, right? Because an organization can't learn anything about an environment that it doesn't gather information about. And no, the only people who can gather soft information, that is information that can be seen but it's hard to quantify, uh, are those who are actually there, who are actually there uh, in the situation able to sort of gather, able to see that data. Uh, we're also going to get less flexibility and adaptability uh, because, of course, rules may and processes may constrain uh, what agents do. On the other hand, if we navigate by judgment, as I put it, if we radically empower those on the ground uh, to drive what happens in, in aid interventions, uh, we're going to get greater agent initiative. Uh, we'll get more of the soft information I was just talking about. We'll get more flexibility. Uh, and we might get more intrinsic motivation, but we're also going to get fallible agent judgment. And that doesn't just mean bad type agents who, uh, who engage in waste, fraud, and abuse. It also simply means mistakes, right? So you know, we can think of behavioral economics, arguably, as the systematic study of all the ways that well-intentioned human judgment goes wrong. Our judgment is wrong frequently. Right? Our judgment is wrong. If we look at our own lives over the past few days, I suspect you will find some judgment you made that was not so good. This morning, I was ironing a, short, a shirt while, in perhaps classic fashion here in the UK, watching uh, a rerun of UK Antiques Roadshow. Right? And I uh, went to grab the iron that I was using, and I grabbed the iron side of the iron rather than the other side. This is a terrible judgment, right? I didn't mean to do this. I just made the wrong judgment. We make the wrong judgment calls all the time. And if we rely on people, we're going to have to rely on fallible people uh, like me and perhaps like the rest of us, too. Um, so, you know, look, you know, agencies have this challenge. Of course, this isn't, these are stylized options, right? The real management strategy of an agency is going to be somewhere along a continuum between sort of very tight top down controls and uh, very loose radical agent empowerment. But I think there are reasons to think that agencies are likely to get the balance wrong. Uh, and one of these reasons I think is just common to kind of the world as a whole, which is, you know, if you buy my story here, there's an error to be had of too much control and an error to be had of too little control. And the error of too little control, right, is obvious, right? If we engage in too little control, then we're going to have agents who engage in fraud. We're going to have agents who do the wrong thing. We're going to see people do things they shouldn't do. On the other hand, the error of too much control 
is that we're going to preclude agents from doing things they would otherwise do, but won't do because of the rules, right? And that error is invisible in equilibrium, right? We are not going to see the thing that would have been done but wasn't. And so, you know, faced with two problems, one you can see and one you can't, I think we're likely to over-adjust in response to the problem we can see. Uh, additionally, I think uh, aid agencies have a sort of added challenge, which is the reason we use controls, the reason we use reporting and metrics in foreign aid isn't just to drive better performance, it's to report on that performance. It's to validate what we've done to people higher up the hierarchy, to political authorizers who might control budgets, who might control grants, et cetera, uh, who control funds fundamentally. And that is going to vary. The more insecure your authorizing environment, the more you need to manage up to those from whom you sort of get your money and your ability to operate, the more you may use measurement, the, may, the more you may use controls even when it's not an appropriate strategy. So uh, what does this add up to? Well, my argument here is that most organizations are going to err on the side of too much control more often than too little, and that uh, more insecure agencies are going to make this error even more frequently than less insecure agencies. And what's going to be the consequence of that error? Well, uh, the more unpredictable the environment, right, the greater the sort of returns to local information, to soft information, uh, the greater the returns to navigation by judgment, and the less the task is the kind of task that we can sort of use numbers for, that we can drive accurately using numbers, what I call verifiability, the greater the returns to to navigation by judgment. So I see f a few furrowed brows. What am I really saying here? Uh, this is sort of the graphical representation of the hypotheses. I want to be clear here. There is no data underlying the graph you're seeing right now. This is, this is lines on an Excel, you know, a sort of stylized Excel sheet. Um, what I'm saying is, look, you know, when things are, when environments, say, are more unpredictable, that is going to be harder for everyone for every kind of agency to deal with, right? When the terrain is rocky, uh, the path, the, when the terrain is rocky, the rate of motion of the aid project is gonna be slower, right? But if I'm driving a four-wheel drive vehicle, right? If uh, I've, I've put the sort of person, uh, if I am being led by the person behind the steering wheel, I'm going to be able to better cope with rocky terrain, right? That doesn't mean that my performance is actually going to go up. That doesn't mean that when Ebola comes to West Africa, all of a sudden, if I have my agents in charge, my performance is going to rise in a literal sense. But it means I'm going to be able to better cope with something like that than is an organization uh, that is making decisions from a distant headquarters that is unable to incorporate the same kind of agent judgment and initiative uh, into its production process. Um, so how do I test this? I test this two ways. First, uh, I build the world's largest database of development project outcomes. Uh, this is 14,000 projects across uh, 180 recipient country environments, across 40 years, across nine organizations, across uh, all of the OECD Development Assistance Committee uh, sectors. Um, and uh, I should say, uh, for those students in the room or watching online, uh, that this data is entirely public except for uh, the data from the European Commission. You can go, I would love for you to go, download these data, use these data, think about other questions we can ask in terms of uh, measurement and uh, organizational performance um, and differential organizational performance, which is what I think they're particularly good for. So uh, the nature of the... Uh, the nature of the outcome data here is we're looking at a holistic measure of project performance. That's something like um, the, somebody goes back at the end of the project and says, how good is this project as a whole, right? Is this a really good project? Is this a pretty good project? Is this a moderately unsuccessful project, et cetera? Uh, and there are a lot of reasons to be concerned with that kind of assessment criteria. Uh, I do uh, quite a bit to try to convince uh, myself, frankly, first and foremost, and as a result, the, the reader, that uh, these data are useful in answering these kinds of big questions. Uh, but they do have a certain, I don't know, Churchill on democracy quality, right? You know, they're the worst data except for all other data. And I'll talk a bit more about data quality uh, as I go along. Um, so those projects span the globe, 14,000 projects. Um, if I'll talk today about the 10,000 projects uh, since 1994. Um, here are the main results, uh, which I will show in graphical form here, right? So uh, basically, uh, organizations that have 
more control in the field that navigate by judgment to a greater degree see much less of a difference in project performance as environmental unpredictability changes. And I should say, how do I measure navigation by judgment? I do it first uh, by taking measures from a sort of monitoring survey, a set of monitoring surveys around the Paris Declaration that uh, asked about donor practices. And second, uh, I do field surveys of people who work in aid management agencies, uh, aid management units. So think of people on the recipient countryside who look at the donors every day and say, uh, and, and I ask these individuals, which donors need to go to headquarters, back to headquarters more to make decisions about their projects? And which have agents in the field who can more sort of make decisions about what's going on, right? And what I find is those who uh, do empower their agents more see less of a difference in performance as context shifts. That's not just across country. That's also within country and within sector. So, you know, as Guinea's fragility, as Guinea's unpredictability uh, rises and falls over the period of the data, uh, we also see less of a difference in project performance for the agencies that more radically empower the people on the field to make the decisions about what happens. Um, this effect is clustered in what I call less externally verifiable sectors, right? So uh, you should have in mind here, you know, not building the road, uh, but uh, road administration, transport administration. Not building the water system, uh, but running the water ministry, right? It's in the policy and the administrative tasks and the capacity tasks in all of the things that are, uh, as somebody in this room has written, about building state capacity where we see the real sort of difference uh, in these, uh, in, these, in, these, in these kinds of organizations. Um, so this isn't driven uh, by differential selection of donors into different countries. This is not about who puts their projects where. That doesn't seem to be what's driving this. Happy to talk more about that Q&A. Nor is it about kind of being a good donor overall, right? It's not the case that other measures of what it is to be a good donor have the same result in interaction with environmental unpredictability in terms of predicting state uh, in terms of predicting project performance. Uh, I do a whole bunch more robustness, which again, I'm happy to talk about uh, in the questions. Or were you to purchase the book, there's a good 70 pages, that might not be right, 50 pages of appendix uh, that can provide you with, uh, with more econometric tests. So, but let me illustrate what I'm talking about here, right? I've given you the stylized results, uh, but you know, what does this mean in terms of mechanisms? What's actually happening in these projects, right? Uh, that's something I wanted to, of course, find out myself. Uh, and because of that, I do eight case studies uh, in, the, in the book, uh, looking at South Africa and Liberia, looking at a low navigation by judgment organization, USAID, the US Development Agency, and a relatively higher navigation by judgment organization, DFID, the UK's Department for International Development. And in each of those pairs, I think about uh, one set of sectors that are where we, can, where we think counting might be a better idea, where we think we have verifiable uh, projects that can be driven uh, relatively well with metrics, and one set of sectors where that's less likely to be true. And I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, South African municipal government pair, right? So these are efforts by USAID and DFID uh, to build the ability, uh, to improve the ability of South African municipalities, South African towns, uh, to manage their fiscal affairs. Um, so first, just to say, I do see evidence that uh, political authorizing environments matter to people, and they matter differentially through this link to reporting. So in South Africa, there are, in fact, 13 mentions of Congress and one of Parliament. Uh, and when I saw this result, when I did the search, the first thing I thought to myself is, uh, that's interesting. You know, in the, in the 300 plus hours of interviews, in the 160 interviewees, you know, in all of these data, I actually don't remember anyone saying the word Parliament. And then I discovered uh, that it was me, that I said the word parliament, actually, in the, in the interview transcripts, which is to say, you know, I'm talking to a South African guy who's worked, uh, this is local staff who's worked both for USAID and DFID projects in this sector in South Africa. And I say, look, you keep talking about Congress. You've, talked to, you've mentioned Congress a couple times here. What about parliament? Surely parliament comes up, right? Surely we worry about political authorizers on the other side, too. And he says, you know, not, no, not really. I mean, you know, sure, people talk about London. People talk about headquarters. But there's not all of this dominant talk about political authorizers. But for the US, for USAID, it's always about, to the bolded quote at the end, the Congress wants these numbers 
because they are providing so much for South Africa and they want to know what is it that we have done with their money. And what I really love about this quote is it makes perfect sense. If I gave somebody a bunch of money, I would want to know what they had done with my money too, right? Wanting to know what happens to your money is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And I think we sometimes ascribe to those who want to sort of control aid uh, nefarious motives that I don't think need to be there to get this result. It's perfectly reasonable to want to see where your money is going, in my view. Uh, but sometimes, uh, I'm arguing, that desire may have sort of con counterproductive results. Right? You may get less uh, when you try to engage in those kinds of controls. So the US government, just to say, long history of the US government uh, being a quite insecure authorizing environment for USAID and US agencies. A former USAID administrator, that is the head of USAID, uh, described this as obsessive measurement disorder, uh, which he defines as something like the mistaken belief that things are going to get better by accounting them. Um, you know, I have quotes about, uh, about US government programs that talk about targets being set from above, things adding up to arbitrary numbers. Uh, one long time uh, US government official uh, describes US aid as an agency under siege for 30 years now. And what, what happens when you're under siege? Well, it makes you cautious. Of course it does, right? When you think that you are under attack, you try really hard to make sure that you don't engage in any action you won't be able to defend. And that means you take fewer risks than you might otherwise, than you might believe are in fact appropriate uh, to get the best possible outcomes. So let's talk about these projects for just another few minutes. So um, these are both projects in the late 2000s. They're both projects in northeastern South Africa. They cover almost exactly the same number of communities. Their budgets are almost exactly the same size. It depends whether you use the exchange rate at the beginning or end of the project, which one is bigger. Um, there are a couple communities in, what, in which, in fact, both projects work. And they both want to do the same thing. I would argue that you could flip the stated goal of, of the projects. You could assign USAIDs to DFIDs and DFIDs to USAID, and it would have changed nothing about the project, right? That basically, they wanted to do the same thing with their money. They recognized the same problem. Uh, and how did they go about solving these problems? Well, that's very different. So um, for USAID, it was all about training visits. We're going to send somebody out. We're going to have them go deliver a training. Um, and then we're going to have them come back. They're going to build capacity through this training, this training uh, mechanism. Um, for DFID, on the other hand, uh, resident advisors drive the show. So we're going to take an advisor. Uh, we're going to put them in a community for a few years. And we're going to have that advisor uh, guide implementation, guide what happens in that community. Um, and that means, of course, that they're going to focus on very different things. So while USAID is going to try to train staff, uh, DFID is going to have advisors do much fuzzier things, right? So unblock delivery obstacles, achieve institutional coherence, things that are a heck of a lot harder to know if you've done successfully, and certainly a heck of a lot harder to know if somebody else has done successfully. Um, and you know, so how do you begin delivering these things? Well, you know, for USAID, there are long lists of dates and times. So, you know, today's uh, the 11th. On a day like May 11th, 2007, something like that, I could tell you how many people went where, right? Conducted what trainings. I can tell you, uh, in some cases, uh, how much their flights cost uh, and what the reimbursement process looked like. If they drove, uh, in some cases, I know what the gas mileage was that they were reimbursed upon. Uh, in some cases, I have pictures of the setting. In some cases, I know how much was spent on lunch. Uh, in at least one case, I know how large the training structure was by measurement, right? So, you know, the width and dimensions and the length of the actual training hall. And of course, I know how many people were trained uh, and what their names were. I have sign in forms. I don't always know their names, sometimes that's redacted. But, the point is, this is the kind of information I have. I, I can tell you, in some ways, more about that training than I can tell you about my train trip down here from Manchester earlier today, right? Uh, I can tell you an incredible amount about that training, but I can't tell you whether anyone learned anything and whether they did anything with the information that was conveyed. Um, on the other hand, for DFID, I can tell you vanishingly little, right? Uh, what I can show you are these these assessments. So these, these advisors conducted assessments and did implementation reports. And then I can show you their reporting, 
which was their, uh, not to reuse, their assessment of their assessment, in a sense, right? So, you know, look, many of us in this room are students or teach students. You know, I would say the DFID program is something like uh, I'm going to tell the student to write the test, to compose the test, right? Then the student will take the test. Then the student will grade the test that they've taken and tell me how they did, right? Which is not a terribly good way of writing a test, of writing a control mechanism if your goal was to control. And so what I want to set up here is we have a potential error of too much control on the one hand and a potential error of too little control uh, on the other. I'm not worried that USA didn't have tight enough controls, nor am I worried that DFID had too many. But what happens? What happens when we run the horse race between the projects? Well, the USAID staff, so the deputy chief of party for USAID, the deputy head of the project, says that the project might not have made the most dent or impact. Uh, the trainers, this is, uh, uh, this is sort of representative of other quotes from trainers as well. Talk about how the trainings don't contribute much, how you very little control over what's going on, how people don't have to listen, et cetera. And if I could say, I spend a fair bit of my time talking to people implementing aid projects, right? And it is pretty remarkable to have people who spent years of their life working on something tell you that the thing that they did, they don't believe did any good. Um, and in some ways, I find that to be one of the most troubling parts about this. You know, there are well-meaning people who entered the industry because they wanted to do good things, who feel that they've spent years of their lives not accomplishing very much. On the other hand, the DFID project is by no means a sort of universal success. Sometimes advisors don't accomplish much, but sometimes they do. And where they do, uh, they do it through making judgments about what to do where and when. Different things happen at different times. The program is flexible and adaptive, uh, and it is driven fundamentally by the judgment of the advisors on the ground. Uh, I end up agreeing with the DFID report, which describes success, I think fairly, as uneven, but including some highly positive examples in selected municipalities. Um, so why is that? How much is that about top-down control? Well. You know, the USAID indicators are chosen according to a different deputy head of the USAID project because they're easier to count. And, you know, I want to highlight here, you know, we could tell this as a story about what agents are incentivized to do, but I think really fundamentally it's a story about the design, about the world of the possible, right? About an agency that needs to choose a project that it can report against and tries to choose the best project it can conditional on being able to generate those reports. And what happens as a result? Well, it does become a numbers game. USAID says they want the numbers. They want information. Uh, another implementer describes it as number chasing, particularly towards the end of the project. So stepping back from those two cases and thinking about the eight cases as a whole, uh, there are clear constraints that stem from political authorizing environments all the way down to agents, right? Uh, there is this connection between high-level politics and what happens on the ground. Uh, the ability to navigate by judgment is linked to success, particularly in environments where it's harder, which are more unpredictable, where it's harder to figure out what's going on from a distance, uh, and for tasks where it's harder to kind of draw those circles, to count those things accurately, uh, to drive success using numbers. Um, and uh, I see evidence both of soft information, of being able to kind of see what's going on, uh, see things that can't be codified and incorporate them into the project, and of organizational learning. The organization, the agents that use their judgment, whether that judgment is proven correct or incorrect, gets smarter, right? Because they've made a decision and thought about it. That's the way we teach, right? You know, you try something, you figure out what's working, you go from there. Um, if you don't make the decision, if you don't use your judgment, that judgment can't get better. Um, that doesn't mean navigation by judgment is perfect, right? Uh, again, this isn't like a, you know, always radically empower people argument. It's kind of a horses for courses argument, right? So, you know, sometimes you can have too much. And I find that in one of the case pairs, uh, USAID's uh, kind of laser sharp focused on numbers uh, in delivering antiretroviral drugs cuts through the noise uh, that affects DFID's project um, and allows them to sort of deliver through the era of denialism in the South African health sector in a way USAID can't and doesn't. So where does this leave me? Well, here's the kind of qualitative results. This is my perception of relative success. Red is DFID, blue is USAID here. Um, here's the stylized graph I showed you at the beginning based on no data whatsoever, um, but based on theory. 
Uh, and here are the quantitative results. And what I want to argue is that these three pictures are sort of mutually reinforcing towards this idea that management matters, and it matters conditionally, uh, that we need the right management for the right kind of task, for the right kind of environment, um, that there's no one-size-fits-all solution here either, that when we look in the mirror, we also need to think about what precisely is going on. Uh, that is the mirror of our organizations, about what precisely is going on in, on the ground uh, and how we can best sort of react to it. So um, political authorizing environments can induce suboptimally conservative behavior and constrained field agents. Measurement is a tool, a key tool in this constraint uh, and is sometimes self-defeating. Navigation by judgment or NDJ as I put it on this slide is contingently beneficial, it's good sometimes, maybe not others. Um, and organizational structure and bureaucratic incentives matter, right? As we talk more and more about implementation, that doesn't just mean what you know, countries or NGOs or field workers do, right? It's also about what the organizations that provide the aid do, right? Management practice uh, at the top has an effect on what happens on the ground and whether development assistance uh, meets its targets, meets its goals. Um, you know, I should say also, uh, especially here in the UK, where there is, in my opinion, a laudable increasing focus on fragile states, one implication of this model is that we're going to see uh, these management structures be particularly ineffective uh, in the most fragile and post-conflict states, right? We're going to make the errors more, and those errors are going to have more of an impact uh, as we deal in, with more fragile environments, which are more unpredictable, where it's much harder to navigate from the top. Um, so broader implications, moving away from the world of foreign aid. Um, look, aid agencies are public agencies. Um, and I think we need to think harder, more broadly, about what I call the reductive seduction uh, of metrics, right? Metrics don't provide us, you know, sort of infallible answers about the world around us. And I think this is a problem for those of us who uh, have long careers ahead of us of one sort or another. I think this is a problem that is going to be an increasing problem of our age, which is to say, uh, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, when James Q. Wilson wrote his, in my view, pioneering book, Bureaucracy, right? He was very interested in what, where we could see outputs and outcomes and where we could figure out what, for what kind of tasks we could observe what kinds of things. Um, and his paradigmatic example, examples of bureaucrats for whom we couldn't see outputs or outcomes were teachers and cops. Of course, today, teacher value added is an industry, is a, is a hot debate. Uh, I do not mean to sort of step into those choppy waters, uh, but only to say, look how far we've come in terms of observation. And for cops, same thing, right? Body cameras, uh, you know, how much discretion should people have? We can now make choices about things that before there were no choices to be made about, right? We used to have discretion not by design but by default because we couldn't engineer it out of the system. But increasingly we can and often we choose to do so. Uh, and sometimes that's for the better. But sometimes there may be costs we don't anticipate. And I think we need to think harder about both the benefits and the costs as a kind of more general, general phenomenon and think about where the, net, where the equities weigh in favor of more or less judgment versus control. You know, a recent uh, episode of the NPR, the US National Public Radio uh, show Planet Money, which, uh, you know, if you listen to Tim Harford's uh, more or less here in the UK, I suspect you would listen to Planet Money in America, were you there? Um, you know, uh, talked about what it called the future of work looking like a UPS truck, right? And the idea here is that UPS, parcel delivery drivers, are now monitored on, they are now told how to, what route to take when they drive. They are told where to park. They are told how to load the truck. Uh, they are told how to unload the truck. They are told which doors to go to when. Uh, they are told in which pocket to keep their pens because it is more efficient to have the pen in the other pocket from the arm you use to open the door, right? Uh, this is pretty tight control. And maybe this drives the best possible performance for parcel delivery. But I would argue that most of our jobs and most of our world doesn't look quite that verifiable. And we need to think about what that matters for all of our lives, not just in the public sector, but also beyond. More broadly, politicians are managers. And there is this kind of more general tension, I would argue, between managing up and delivering down 
in some cases, right? Especially when we can't get good information about what delivering down looks like. And thus, more generally, maybe sometimes we can get more juice with less squeezing, not more. Counterintuitive, though it may seem. So, uh, you know, they say don't judge a book by its cover. Um, but uh, I, would, I welcome you to do so in this case, were you to wish to. Uh, so uh, this uh, image on the cover um, is of uh, is a, f a fisherman in a town which I fear I cannot pronounce correctly, but it's a town called Gloucester, Massachusetts, right, um, in the U.S. And uh, it's where, if, uh, if you know the book or have seen the movie The Perfect Storm, it's uh, where, where that's set. And what, what Gloucester is is it's a fishing community. It's a place where people uh, go out to the sea. They fish. You know, that's the, that's the livelihood. And this statue is a memorial to those who have lost their lives at sea, called locally Man at the Wheel, right? And what Man at the Wheel is, in the context of this book's argument, is an example of a class of people who have used their judgment and have paid the ultimate price for it, a, a tragic price for it. And uh, we mourn them, and we build statues to them. And in my mind, that is entirely appropriate. Uh, but what we don't do is say that because judgment sometimes fails, because fishermen sometimes perish at sea, what we need to do is take the man away from the wheel. We don't say that the right way to navigate a fishing fleet is by GPS from some office on the shore. We know that we're better off with the people with their hand on the, I don't know enough about boats, tiller, rudder, whatever this is, the steering wheel, to, uh, to point the boat in the right direction. Uh, does judgment fail? Of course it does. That's not the question. Of course it fails. It fails in lots of different ways, lots of different times. The question is, is it still sometimes better than the alternative? And maybe sometimes judgment, fallible though it is, uh, is still the best we've got. Thank you. Look forward to your questions. So I don't know how you want to do this. Do you, do you have uh, some questions? You, do you want me to? Yeah. Listen, it would be top down if I said I'm going to direct questions now. So why don't Very we? Kind. Why don't we let you navigate by judgment? Very kind. So maybe I'll take a couple questions and do 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 rounds in that way. If anyone has a query, you, sir, in the back. And um, if you don't mind introducing yourself, hi. just come here. Now, I think that was really the most crucial aspect of it all, because when you, when you look at what is happening in Africa, but, but also other parts of the world as well, um, it's how does it affect your public? How does it affect the general people yeah. in terms of how do they see improvement and in, in this case, the economic lives. Yeah. Um, in Africa, what you find is that there are certain countries that have made this leap. Um, but it's not always countries that are loved by um, the Western democracies. And we're talking about countries like um, Rwanda, Ethiopia, possibly Tanzania. What you find in those countries is basically um, they, they have set an agenda. They have demonstrated a certain amount of discipline, but they've also sort of set targets to say, we are going to get from point A to point B. Now, how does this fit in with your narrative? That's a good question. And how can this be incorporated um, into, into aid projects and things like that? And there are two ways of, of doing this. One, you can say, how can you learn from these people? And B, you can load the dice in their favor. 
but like I said, it doesn't always work out because they're not necessarily what you might call conventionally the most democratic. Thank you. you Thanks for that? the question. Yeah, let me take a few more if I, if I could. social policy and intervention. I thought this was a fascinating talk and it, it echoed many of the experiences that I'm sure many of us have had in, in field. I suppose I, I have one sort of overarching sure. question and worry, which is that it's easy to attack USAID um, and it's done a lot and you hear it on the ground and you hear it at, at high levels. And at a time when, when USAID is under more siege than it ever has been, how can we construct these sorts of critiques yeah. to make them helpful rather than a tool in the weapon of those in Congress who want to pull that funding? It's a great question. One more? Just one more question. I have a um, Lizzie, uh, Lizzie Dipple. I'm at the CSE Center for Study of African Economies. And I have a, a slightly more technical kind of question. Sure. In your, your sort of idea that, or your graphs showing that the more unpredictable countries are, the more likely that this um, sort of management by letting people use their judgment has a, a beneficial effect. What, what criteria do you use for that, that measure of unpredictability? Um, you know, is, is it political? Is it conflict? Is it a, a, a yep. variety of different measures? Good. So let me start here with a slightly more technical question and then broaden, broaden out. So, uh, I use the State Fragility Index, um, which is composed of, it's a kind of aggregate measure for good or ill of sort of political, economic, and social, and there's one more category, um, fragility. And, uh, but I should say that the, the result is uh, not at all sensitive to the parameterization of the measure. So I can throw out any of the subscales of the measure and get the same result. Uh, it has kind of an effectiveness and a legitimacy sort of cross-cutting, I don't know, axis in each scale. I can throw out either of those and get the same result. Um, so that's the measure I use, but uh, I don't think we should be terribly concerned about the nature of that measure, though if, if one was, would be happy to go into more of the, more of the technical, technical details. Uh, and I should say what I find is that uh, organizations that navigate by judgment more quantitatively are more consistent um, rather than saying that they... Uh, in fact, have superior performance in more unpredictable environments. The distinction being that I have to take an agency fixed effect because uh, of the different rating scales different agencies bring to the table. Um, so broadening out to the sort of where do we go from here question. So uh, maybe, uh, was it Boima? Is that? Yeah. 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 So uh, Boima, to your, I think, excellent question. Let me, let me make a couple of points uh, about country target setting and then about accountability uh, writ large. Um, so first, uh, I don't think, you know, I, I'm, I, what, what, what came to my mind as you were talking was Yuan Yuan Ang's recent book on how China escaped the poverty trap, which I recommend to everyone. I think it's a great book, which is all about how China set targets as a country and then innovated to reach those targets, right? Let, you know, multiple things uh, be done in flexible and adaptive ways in different places, um, and as a result, got kind of different performances from which it could learn and from which it could adjust, right? Uh, so, you know, the idea that we should set long-term goals uh, and we should set long-term targets in that sense for what we want, where targets basically means goals rather than numbers in three years, right? I'm in favor of targets. Targets get used both ways, so it's a bit confusing in this regard. So when we're talking about long-term goals, I think that's great, right? And I think we can drive success through central plans so long as those central plans are about kind of setting a direction rather than controlling every bit of what, what happens in each place. And I think if we look at the Rwandas and the Ethiopias and the Chinas, countries that I agree, those of us in the West are uh, sometimes, sometimes have complicated uh, feelings about, or our nations as a whole have complicated feelings about. Um, I think we see innovation uh, and navigation by judgment in you know, sort of concert with sort of broad central objectives. So you also brought up the word accountability. Um, and I think, you know, so the, at the risk of uh, being sort of, 
uh, I don't know, well, well too far from the field. Um, you know, the Latin root of accountability is the same as the Latin root of to count, right? That's where the word accountability comes from. It comes from counting. And we tend to think of accountability through a kind of what can you show me using data sort of way, right? Uh, I don't think that moving to more navigation by judgment is a move away from accountability. I think it's a move towards accountability in the sense that I think what we have now is a kind of pyrrhic victory of numbers. We have the sort of facade of knowledge, right? Uh, the facade of accountability because we have something to report, but it's not telling us about what's actually happening, right? Uh, and I think as we gain more information about what's actually happening, that is something that we uh, can then use to make our organizations more accountable, by which I mean delivering more of what they want to. And you know, to that last point of sort of what aid agencies want to do, uh, this, this book asks an instrumental question. So there are those, indeed, there are those in this building, right? I, I'm thinking of uh, Dean Woods, right, who have written at great length about the ways in which the things aid agencies want and aid organizations want ought be altered for the better. And I think, I think there is a broad and rich discourse to have about that. But what this project is about is an instrumental question. You, the agency, tell me what you wanted to do. I help tell you what the best way to deliver that thing that you wanted to do is, right? That doesn't mean I agree necessarily with your goals for the situation. That I don't know if you've chosen the right targets, right? The right, the right, the right uh, objectives. Uh, but whatever objectives you choose, surely you want to deliver on them, right? No one benefits when the project as created uh, does not go anywhere at all. And that's the sort of you know, framework in which I'm asking the question, which doesn't mean I always agree with the objectives either, uh, only that that's not kind of where this book is situated. So Lucy, to your very, very kind way of saying, uh, is this the right time to be, uh, to be you know, um, I don't know, noting all of the failures with USAID. So first, in my slight defense, of course, when I started this research, it was some time in the past. You know, one, one can't time these things quite that well. But second, you know, I don't know that I feel that way about this argument. And, and having presented this you know, to a variety of donors, to USAID and you know, World Bank staff and the World Bank Executive Board and you know, KFW and DFID and, and, and many others and private foundations, you know, what I, what, what I find is that people, uh, at its best, my hope is that what these data can suggest is that there are mutually beneficial different ways of working, right? That both give agencies more space uh, to do the good work that the people who work in them want to do uh, and satisfy the demands of political authorizers. You know, I don't have this view that political authorizers are kind of, you know, Voldemort uh, who want bad things or whose shadow uh, is meant to, you know, sort of make aid fail. Uh, I think often we have here, and call me naive, I think often we have here a kind of uh, information asymmetry of a different sort, right? Where we assume the worst about, about the others, about those in the agency if we're inside the authorizing environment, about those in the authorizing environment if we're inside the agency, and we end up in this kind of low trust equilibrium, right? Where uh, I try to tightly control because I don't know what else I can do to try to get the performance that we, in fact, both seek. Um, and to me, my hope is that data uh, and argument that suggests that sometimes control is self-defeating is a way of sort of creating those spaces. And I should say, you know, being here in the UK, I think it's fair to say that you know, DFID does better than USAID on these measures uh, and in this book. But I'm not sure that DFID is moving at the moment in the right direction on these measures either. You can be both higher and going downhill at the same time, right? Uh, going downhill puts it too, too, too strongly. But, you know, I worry about a kind of creeping of compliance culture. Um, and when I've presented to sort of donor audiences here in the UK, I highlight the idea that, you know, it's not like we have a sort of saint and a sinner here. Uh, what we have are two complicated organizations reacting to political realities uh, and changing as organizations inevitably change uh, in how they behave relative to their authorizing environments as those environments change. So, more questions? Sir? So, to kick it off, uh, it 
thank you, Dan. This is a really interesting argument. Um, I mean, that has a long lineage in a certain uh, extent. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, my first question is about the extent to which this has to do with foreign aid, because it's about foreign aid. All your data are about foreign aid. Mm -hmm. But then at the end, um, you, you reach beyond your data and talked about the UPS man. Uh, and you could, have you, you could have talked about the way that Amazon organizes its workplace, right? And so it exploits its workers, but it gets much more efficient outcomes because they're highly controlled environments and it's figured out how to be efficient. And I Absolutely. assume UPS is doing the same thing. So uh, I guess my question about foreign aid is how much of this has to do with the fact that um, this is aid coming from one country to another country uh, and in a long yeah. delay, we have a sort of an imperial past that um, this, this speaks to, and people resent that sort of control versus how much of this is about um, workers just like to have their own control. So, so that's my first question. My second question um, is, it, it's really um, rather fanciful, um, but uh, <laughs> instead of saying um, that everyone should do uh, navigation by judgment in terms of foreign aid, isn't the implication of your book that what we should do is figure out which countries systematically prefer to have more control in their foreign aid and send them into the more controllable environments and then send DFID and those who are willing to be a little more lax or, or a little more um, uh, flexible, a, yeah. magnanimous uh, with their sort of discretion uh, into the wilder environment. So, so the problem of foreign aid is that we've sorted incorrectly. We just yes. have, we, and, they, and there should be a division of labor. Great questions. Anybody else want to join this uh, round of queue? All right. I'll answer. Oh, yep. Um, I guess my question is a bit related to Yeah. Um, so my question is a bit related to Peppers. Um, what I was wondering was that how much of this is about um, the capacity of the countries who were implementing these projects. Because from my experience, I can, um, I've seen DFID implementing two very similar programs, but countries having, uh, sorry, not countries, but organizations having different capacities because of which they're able to bargain and kind of, you know, exercise more control. So would you say that navigation by judgment is also about, you know, the capacity of the organizations and them being able to bargain and not so much about you know, the form of management as such. And this is the grantee organization or the recipient? The recipient. Of the, not of the assistance, but, you know, walk me through the, the case slightly more. Yeah, so I'm saying that imagine that there are two different organizations who are the recipient of the aid, right? But yeah. one organization yeah. is able to. Yeah. Okay, great. Another question? All right. Let me, let me answer those two then. So um, the, uh, so let me start with, uh, you know, how much does this have to do with, uh, with it being from one country to another and how much is this a management question? Uh, and uh, at the risk of, you know, the oldest academic move in the book, let me say yes as the answer to that question. So that is to say, Look, foreign aid is different in some ways, right? Not only because of the colonial past, but also because there's no feedback loop, right? So, you know, the beneficiaries of aid are not part of the, of the public that votes on the aid, right? So however we might feel about marginalized members of our own society, ultimately they are also voters in all but a few cases, right? Uh, and in foreign aid, the people receiving the benefits cannot form part of the political constituency that then decides where money goes. And there are good reasons from public administration theory to think that that is going to mean we're going to get kind of more extremes in this domain of dysfunction than we might in others. Um, but I do think this is a management question, and I think that that is a management question that has echoes in the modern management literature as well. And so uh, I should say my argument isn't that uh, no one should manage like UPS. It's that we should think, when is foreign aid like UPS, and then manage it that way when appropriate. Uh, but that, indeed, the direction of travel is the other way, only because we're all the way on one side. If we went all the way to the other side, this book would be called, 
I don't know, navigation from the top, you know, when, the yeah, when agents need to be told, we need to, need to, you know, sort of give up when old drivers, no, when drivers need to figure out how to sort of take driver training and follow the lines in the road or something like that. Yes, I need more work on the counter title. I agree with that too, if, that, if that's what you think. So, um, you know, it's, uh, and I think we see this kind of, I don't know, you know, look at Ethan Bernstein's work on what he calls the transparency paradox, right? You know, look at uh, General Stanley McChrystal just wrote a book called Team of Teams. Probably somebody working with him wrote a book called Team of Teams where he talks about empowered accountability of troops on the ground uh, in Iraq counterinsurgency operations. Uh, I think this is a more general phenomenon, and you're right, I am stepping beyond my data in doing so. Um, and that, that, that thus does make it kind of a, a kind of speculative, right, in that sense. Uh, but I think we see this tension. I think if we ask ourselves, do we see this tension in our lives? I suspect many of us might agree that we do. Um, and if you don't, then, then, then fair enough on that, uh, on that side of things. I mean, and so do uh, reassigning and then on reassigning. Uh, so, so the question yes, is no, whether it's just, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, I think that's right. That's, so that one way of thinking about it, indeed, I should say, by the way, the first implication of what we could do is uh, that I put in the book, that I put in chapter nine, chapter eight, is to uh, think about, when we think about donor coordination, to think about relative management constraint as one of the things that allows us to do different kinds of projects. So just as you say, the US AIDS, in this stylized case of the world, build more roads, the diffids of the world do more governance work, right? So I do think that there are gains to be had there. Frankly, I don't find that to be the most uh, likely to be implemented of the kinds of recommendations uh, that, I, that, I, that I put out there. That is to say, I think that kind of allocative work makes sense in a model, but would be difficult to do in practice inside a donor organization. Um, and I also think that, frankly, since I think if there is an optimal point for navigation by judgment, I'm not sure that any donor has reached it. Uh, we will find out if donors change their practices and performance at some point starts to decline. So even in that reassignment world, uh, we would need to leave some things off the table because we don't actually have all of the capacities we would need for all of the kinds of challenges to which we would want to assign management practice. So uh, the capacity of organizations. So um, I'm going to take the liberty of both answering your question and then broadening it, if that's OK. So. Uh, in a direct sense, absolutely. So, you know, look, if we give money, so what matters to foreign aid delivery? Does capacity matter? Yes. Do recipient country environments matter? Yes. Does the kind of the task matter? Yes. The, lots, lots of things matter to the success of aid projects. Um, and I couldn't agree more that if people actually have the ability to do the thing you've asked them to do, that's pretty critical to whether they can do it, right? So, you know, asking my three and a half year old to cook dinner would be unlikely to succeed whatever control scheme I use, frankly, right? Uh, well, it depends. It depends what I wanted for dinner, actually. But, but in general, probably not a great idea, right? Um, I also think that uh, going beyond that question, uh, there's suggestive work that the way aid is managed, the way it is delegated from a hypothetical donor to maybe a contractor to a local implementer has something to say about how that local implementer evolves. So capacity, especially for organizations that often receive donor funds, isn't just, it's not just that there's capacity and then the donor responds to it. It's that the way the donor manages the project has something to do with the trajectory of capacity development for the organization, right? So there's a little bit more of a two-way street here. But does capacity matter to what gets done uh, in foreign aid? Absolutely. And that matters not just outside the agency when we look at NGOs. It also matters when we look inside the agency, when we look at the agency itself. Uh, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the idea that you know, sort of people often come, not always, but people often come to foreign aid because they have some sense of mission. They have some drive to want to do something they believe is a good thing. And that's not true of aid alone. That's true of many jobs, thankfully, for all of us in the world. It's true of many jobs that people do because they feel a mission. They feel a calling to do it. Uh, and when we make a job less enjoyable to do, right? when we give people less autonomy, we encourage the people who 
have come for those reasons to leave the organization or not join the organization, right? So similar to the story I just told about NGOs versus donors, I think we can tell that same kind of dynamic story about the nature of the personnel inside an organization and the management practice of the, of the organization. Is it the only thing that affects who's in the organization? Of course not. Pay, promotion, you know, security of tenure, lots of things matter to what job you take. But one of those things is whether you feel you get to make a difference at the job you do. And as we make the job of aid, uh, frankly, one where agents feel they have less ability to actually put into practice the change that they want to see in the world, uh, I think we lose some of the people who might be most able to, in fact, do so. And we need to think about management practice, not just as kind of conditional on the kind of agents we have, but also as an input into the organization in attracting and retaining the kind of agents we want to have. Um, so, thank you. Any other questions before I close? So Excellent. let me just say that um, it takes strong uh, commitment to the life of the mind to come out on uh, Friday evening uh, for a talk at, at 5.30. Um, and I want to thank the audience for this, and I want to thank Dan Honig for delivering um, uh, a, a talk at the level of the commitment that the audience has shown. Thank you, Dan, very much. We appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you.